I don't know about you, but uh, I'm looking forward already to our panel, and I'm on it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take uh, the director's prerogative and, and uh, uh, throw out a few questions for uh, our, all of our speakers uh, later today. But uh, for our next speaker, um, excited uh, about this one as well. Uh, Gary Gallagher is the John L. Now III Professor in the History of the American Civil War at the University of Virginia. He's published over 30 books uh, examining various military campaigns of the Civil War, the Lost Cause Myth, and of course, Robert E. Lee. His most recent books are Becoming Confederates, Paths to a New National Loyalty, and The Union War. Professor Gallagher has received numerous awards for writing and teaching, and is the founding president of the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites. I came to know Gary when I was directing a summer program uh, back uh, 2009 through 2011, I think it was. Uh, it was called the Te uh, Presidential Teaching Academy. We had a grant from Congress, believe it or not, uh, six years worth of taking high school teachers to Philadelphia, Gettysburg, as they pronounce it, and Washington, D.C., sights and sounds tour, and uh, a lot of reading. Uh, we'd bring in guest speakers, and when it came to Gettysburg, of course, we had to tour the battlefields. We actually tried to do it in one day, one time. Uh, this was with another uh, Civil War historian that you might have heard of, Jim McPherson. Um, yeah, but we learned that wasn't the best thing to do because at, after 10 o'clock, I didn't know that the park closes. So you've got Jim McPherson out there telling us uh, some such thing, and the park ranger comes in and says, you guys have to leave, it's 10 o'clock. And I said, we got Jim McPherson here, man. I didn't say that. <laughs> I wanted to say that. <laughs> uh, at any rate, for the last three years, we brought in Gary Gallagher. And that was fantastic, because not only do we have a guy, in my opinion, who's of the equal caliber uh, in terms of knowledge uh, about the Civil War uh, as a James McPherson, uh, but the guy actually was relaxed enough to do Pickett's Charge in a straw hat, cigar at the ready, uh, and we live to tell the tale. So uh, uh, that was a wonderful experience for us. Uh, the title of his Class of 1960 lecture is Robert E. Lee, Honor in Defeat. Please welcome Professor Gary Gallagher. Thank you. I'm going to switch types of microphones here. And there we are. I've switched. I'm going to point that one the other way. Cigars should be obligatory on battlefields. You can make a really fine connection with U.S. Grant. Uh, if you're on a battlefield smoking a cigar the way God intended for them to be smoked on a battlefield and imagining in some little way that you're in another century. I'm always happy to come to Lexington. I've been coming here for a long time. I have no idea how many times I've come here. The first time I was 14. And we drove all the way from Colorado to come to Lexington. Poor travelers' bones were still mounted uh, down in the basement of the chapel then. Mercifully, they've been laid to rest now outside. And little Sorrel was still, I guess he's still. That's he's, they gave him a, a sort of uh, shampoo and fluff a little while ago. But still, <laughs> it's a cruelty to keep little Sorrel on display, I think. I would, I would have mercy and... Put the poor beast away. I have a slightly different title to my talk than the one in your program. Mine is Robert E. Lee, Honor and Coming to Terms with Defeat. It's about the same thing, but what I'm going to be talking about today is how Lee made the transition, and this follows on what Bill just talked about, how he made the transition from this great war, uh, the greatest war in our history, to what proved to be a very troubled peace. In the course of examining this period, I'm going to be engaging with some very widely held ideas about Lee, more widely held in some places than other, but widely held in many places. And some of the things I'm going to say, I'm almost certain, are going to upset some of you, but, that, but just relax. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to be that bad, and we'll have fun talking about it afterwards. Uh, that'll be the best part of this when you have all of us up here. And everything I'm going to say I don't think will upset you, but maybe some things will. Some of these ideas about Lee that will come up in the course of my talk include, first, that he had no bitterness toward his enemy, that he always just called them those people, and he just never really uh, developed a true 
antipathy toward them. This was because he was a gentleman and chivalric and sort of a throwback to an earlier kind of warfare that didn't have the hard edge that a war waged by cold killers like Ulysses S. Grant and William Tecumseh Sherman brought to the battlefield. Another of these common notions is that Lee was an ardent reconciliationist and that the healing began at Appomattox. Whenever you drive into the county now toward Appomattox, that's what the sign tells us, Appomattox, where the healing began. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, another one is that Lee was preeminently a Virginian. If you want to understand Lee, all you need to know is that he was a Virginian. Everything flows from that. If you understand that, as Douglas Southall Freeman said, there is no mystery there. That's all you need to know is that he was a Virginian. And I would say that's all you need to know unless you want to know more. But if you're comfortable just knowing that, then sit back and relax and think of him only as a Virginian. If you view him this way, he's someone who isn't really even that upset about the end of the war because he never really embraced the Confederacy. He's a Virginian and there's always Virginia. There was a Virginia before the Confederacy. There's a Virginia after the Confederacy. So the Confederacy is sort of a blip on a screen that's dominated by Virginia. And finally, I'll talk about the idea that he was never really comfortable with slavery. Uh, some writings go so far as to say he's kind of a proto-abolitionist, which of course is not true, but more broadly the idea that he wasn't that upset with the coming of emancipation, almost relieved that the war brought an end to the institution of slavery. Those are some of the things that I'll weave in and out of what I'm going to do. Now I'm going to get my big watch that has real hands on it. Uh, that tells me exactly what time it is, so that I don't transgress my limit here, and we have a little bit of time at the end. Devotion to honor and duty, as he understood them, was an essential element of Robert E. Lee's character. The two words, honor and duty, possess complex meanings, of course, and the 19th century Southern concept of honor has inspired a pretty large academic literature uh, that's beyond the scope of what I'm going to do today. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about that literature. For our purposes, I'll say that when Lee spoke or wrote about honor and duty, and he often used some version of both those terms in the same statement, when he spoke about them, he typically had in mind how his actions would be perceived by and reflect on his family and friends and how his public reputation would be affected by what he did and said. Although he almost certainly never said duty is the sublimest word in the English language, time and again during his lifetime, his decisions, he explained his decisions in terms of doing what he considered to be in line with honor and with duty. For example, in a letter to former Confederate General Wade Hampton, the South Carolina cavalryman who'd been one of his subordinates during the war, Lee addressed his decision to resign from the United States Army with an eye toward honor and duty. He said, quote, I did only what my duty demanded. I could have taken no other course without dishonor. And if all were to ever be done again, I should act in precisely the same manner. He was comfortable with his decision because it accorded with his conception of honor and duty. In General Order Number 9, his famous April 10, 1865 farewell message to the men of the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee accorded those who had remained in the ranks the highest of compliments. And he's talking to the ones who remained in the ranks. He's not talking to the ones who fell out of the ranks between Pitts uh, Petersburg and Richmond and Appomattox, which was about half of the Army. The men had fought long and hard against formidable odds, affirmed Lee, and now they had lost and must go home. You will take with you, emphasized the commanding general, the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed. Duty faithfully performed. He took that language almost verbatim from George Washington's farewell to the Continental soldiers at the end of the American Revolution. As you know here, Washington is Lee's great idol for his entire life. And you find echoes of Washington throughout Lee's life. Very direct references to Washington and many indirect references to Washington. And here in General Order Number 9, you find a very nice example of that. 
Go back and read Washington's farewell order. They're making the same points. The difference is Washington is making these points, conveying his affection to an army that emerged victorious, and Lee is doing the same thing to an army that emerged defeated from their war. During the hard winter of 1864 and 1865, with the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac locked in the grinding siege at Petersburg, Lee recorded in concise fashion how he conceived of the link between honor and duty. There is a true glory and a true honor. He wrote, the glory of duty done, the honor of integrity of principle. It's just written on a scrap of paper and found among his papers later. Nowhere did Lee's sense of honor and duty stand out more obviously than the manner in which he coped with Confederate defeat. And this, we need to remind ourselves, this isn't sort of a defeat for the Confederacy. This is an overwhelming, unequivocal defeat for the Confederacy. The kind of defeat that no other segment of white American society has ever experienced. There's nothing, it is not an American experience a white American experience to be vanquished this way. It is a Southern white experience, and that is what Lee, as with the rest of the former Confederates, is trying to come to terms with, despite very strong personal grievances against the North, and anger about the disruption of white social and racial control in the former Confederacy, Lee meticulously refrained from any public criticism of the victors. An honorable response to the verdict of Appomattox, he believed, obliged him and the rest of the white South to submit to the dictates of the United States government. Lee's attitude toward defeat can be summed up very simply. The Confederacy had mounted the best military defense that it could. It had been defeated by greater United States military power in the course of the war, and now it must do whatever the United States told it to do. Those are the consequences of defeat. There aren't two options about how you're going to respond to this. We'll either submit or we won't. We'll do something else. There's only one box to check, and that box is we will submit, in Lee's view. He had become an ardent Confederate nationalist during the conflict. Lee's most powerful loyalty during the war was to the Confederacy, not to Virginia. If Virginia's interests and Confederate interests came into conflict during the war, Lee, not usually, not almost always, but always said the Confederate interests take precedence because this is a national effort. If the national effort fails, Virginia's interests interest will fail as well. In, he is an ardent Confederate nationalist. That is something he shared with Jefferson Davis. That's one reason they got along so well. They got along as well as Grant and Lincoln did. And they got along so well primarily because on that fundamental question, what can the national government do to win the war? Their answer was always anything it needs to do. This is exactly on Bill's theme earlier. Anything it needs to do. Do we need to conscript men? Do it. Lee's staff helped write that legislation in the Confederacy. The United States had never forced anyone to put on a uniform. Never. This is a complete break with precedent in United States history. The US government didn't do it till the next year, as you know. The Confederate government did it in the spring of 1862, and R.E. Lee is on board with that. Whatever it takes for Confederate victory, that is what we will do. The destruction of this incipient slaveholding republic profoundly distressed him, profoundly. He's not a little bit upset that the Confederacy lost the war and went out of existence. He is profoundly affected by that. But in his post-war public statements, he put aside all impulses to lash out at the North for its conduct during the war or its policies during Reconstruction, something that I believe must have tested him sorely because on many occasions after the war because he nurtured a considerable amount of anger regarding a number of issues that had arisen while the fighting raged between 1861 and 65. Lee left Appomattox in early April 1865 with private feelings that we will never know fully. One of the things I really like about him is that he was remarkably free of the modern predilection for sharing 
or burying one's soul, I should say, at the drop of a hat. Oh, let me tell you something else about me and what I've been thinking and feeling. I really want you to know what I've been feeling. And wait, I, I remember one thing more that I've been feeling that I haven't inflicted on you yet. And let me tell you, uh, this cottage industry of sharing one's pain, so evident on our afternoon television programs now, and even now infecting what used to be hard news programs in the United States, it, it, that is a 20th century an early 21st century phenomenon that I think would have mystified Lee. He never would have gone on Oprah, I can promise you, uh, if he had had a chance. He just didn't feel the need to make sure you knew everything about him and everything he was thinking. Oh, so important, so important. We can see in photographs of Lee the physical toll that the war exacted. On him. I used to think he was hopelessly old, of course. Now that I'm older than he was when he died, I've changed my view on that. And think he was really just pretty much in his prime, uh, even at the end. Uh, he'd been a robust 54-year-old man with dark hair and mustache, what hair he had left, uh, in April 1861. Four years later, as we all know, his hair had turned first gray, gray by 1862, white by the end of the war. He became an old man in four years. Lee aged, Lincoln aged tremendously too, as all of you know. Grant didn't seem to age quite so much, Bill. He, he came through, the he was a lot younger. The robust physique that Lee had going to the war, he was, a very, he was a very robust man through almost all of his life. That deteriorated during the war as well, as you know, because of rigors in the field and because his heart problems uh, became more serious in the war. But the war also hardened his attitude toward the North. Although frequently described, as I said earlier, as almost free of enmity toward United States soldiers and civilians, and this most common perception, I'll say one more time, is that he never referred to them as anything but those people. You can only believe that if you don't read anything that Lee wrote during the war. And if you don't read anything, it's liberating. Uh, if you really don't know anything about what you're discussing, you can say anything. It's sometimes called being a novelist. <laughs> but if you're going to be tethered to the evidence, you cannot believe that Lee harbored no animosity toward his enemies during the war. He, in fact, harbored deep resentments against an enemy he believed behaved dishonorably in many ways and in many places throughout the conflict. And I'm going to give some examples of this because I think it's important to understand the depth of Lee's antipathy in this regard if you are going to appreciate how honor, his sense of honor, shaped his behavior after the war. It's important to know how he really felt privately to appreciate how he behaved publicly after the war. So I'm going to give you a few quotations suggesting just how angry he became sometimes during the war toward union and, mil and <clears throat> union military and political leaders that he believed transgressed the boundaries of an honorable war. As early as December 1861, he referred to, quote, the ruin and pillage inflicted on various parts of the Confederacy by what he termed the vandals in blue. It's a little harsher than those people. Uh, writing to one of his daughters about the fate of Arlington, which had been seized by the United States government, as you know, very early in the conflict, he betrayed considerable bitterness. Your old home, if not destroyed by our enemies, has been so desecrated that I cannot bear to think of it. I should have preferred it to have been wiped from the earth rather than to have been degraded by the presence of those who revel in the ill they do for their own selfish purposes. And the United States government, of course, Montgomery Meigs particularly, I mean, Arlington National Cemetery is there. It didn't just happen to be there. It's there because that's a direct message to R.E. Lee. Let's bury our dead there, said the United States. And then let's put a Freedman's Village there later too. I mean, these are not, they didn't just happen. These are messages sent to Lee. And Lee got the message and was very angry about that. When Union General John Pope arrived in Virginia from the Western Theater in the summer of 1862, he announced that he was going to bring a harder war to the Confederacy. He was a Republican. Most of the Union generals were Democrats. Pope was a Republican. He said he was going to hang guerrillas, punish any civilians who helped guerrillas, and otherwise bring a more direct kind of war. 
to the Eastern Theater. He didn't follow through on all those things, but Lee reacted strongly. In July 1862, he wrote to Secretary of War George with Randolph that he longed to, quote, destroy the miscreant pope. I love the word miscreant. It's one we don't use. I tell my students, they can actually look right at someone and call them a miscreant, and the person won't know whether to be upset or not. <laughs> But in the mid-19th century, you would know to be upset. Our great friend, the Oxford English Dictionary, tells us that miscreant in the mid-19th century meant, quote, an unbeliever, a heretic, a vile wretch, a villain. <laughs> Lee knew that. Again, we've gone beyond those people uh, in how he felt about them. He also said that, Lee, that Pope must be suppressed as one would deal with a swarm of termites or an infestation of fire ants in Austin. You suppress them. Uh, they're not really humans. Similarly, when Union artillery shelled the city of Fredericksburg on December 11, 1862, Lee, who was watching from the high ground to the, to the west of the Rappahannock, most of you have stood on part of that high ground on Marie's Heights and looked over to Stafford Heights on the other side of the river, and there's this great artillery duel going on two days before the actual battle began. Lee angrily remarked that the Federals, quote, delight to destroy the weak and those who can make no defense, it just suits them. Now, what he didn't say is his soldiers, William Barksdale's Mississippians, were using the houses in town as cover to shoot the Union engineers who were building the pontoon bridges. And the Union commander said, we had to shell the city. The Confederates were using it for cover. But the point is, Lee became angry at the Federals there. Few episodes of the war brought out Lee's bitterness toward the North more dramatically than the hanging of his second cousin, William Orton Williams, as a spy on June 9th. 1863, the same day that Lee's middle son, Rooney, was very badly wounded at Brandy Station. More than three years after Williams was hanged, a letter from Lee to Martha Custis Williams, whom he called Marky, as many of you know, indicated the continuing depth of his anger. My own grief is as poignant now as on the day of the hanging, he wrote Marky. And my blood boils at the thought of the atrocious outrage against every manly and Christian sentiment which the great God alone is able to forgive. He obviously was not able to forgive, uh, even though it's several years later. Above all, union policies that threatened the social stability of the South slaveholding society infuriated Lee. Before the war, in a letter to Mrs. Lee, he had pronounced slavery, quote, a moral and political evil in any country. That's often quoted, that passage from the letter. But he went on to make the point that he didn't think anything should be done to get rid of it, that it would go in God's own time. The whole question of how long slavery lasted should be left in God's hands. And he then deplored what he termed, quote, the systematic and progressive efforts of certain people in the North to interfere with and change the domestic institutions of the South. Domestic institution of the South, that's slavery, as you know. Under the Constitution, it is a domestic institution, meaning the states have control over it, not the federal government in most ways. Such actions by those certain people, said Lee, can only be accomplished by them, he underlined that, through the agency of a civil and servile war. Abolitionists might create an apocalyptic moment by persevering in what he called their evil course. And this is, of course, one of the, the great fear in the minds of many white Southerners before the war was, of course, Santa Domingo. That is in their minds, that the great widespread slave rebellion that results in the butchery of many white people and, in that case, the installation of a black republic. That is very much a theme that runs through the first half of the 19th century in Southern thought and fears, white Southern thought and fears. Lee went on to deploy a nice geographic stereotype of New Englanders widely held uh, in the South. He asked rhetorically, is it not strange that the descendants of those Pilgrim Fathers who crossed the Atlantic to preserve their own freedom of opinion have always proved themselves intolerant of the spiritual liberty of others? Although seldom quoted by historians, Lee's response to Lincoln's final proclamation of emancipation leaves no doubt about the depth of his feeling. He wrote a letter on January 10th, nine days after the proclamation was announced. He wrote to Secretary of War James Seddon. Seddon had succeeded Randolph uh, late the preceding year. 
Lee called for greater mobilization and effort on the part of the Confederacy in the face of this new threat from the United States, which threatened, in his view, complete disruption of the entire Confederate social system. Lincoln's proclamation laid out, quote, a savage and brutal policy, stated Lee, which leaves us no alternative but success or degradation worse than death if we would save the honor of our families from pollution, our social system from destruction. Lee's use of degradation, pollution, and social system, uh, those are words that are often deployed in antebellum Southern rhetoric when they're talking about the possible consequences of abolitionism. And they highlight the degree to which Lincoln's policy menaced far more than the political integrity of the Confederate state in Lee's view. Two years earlier, this is the last of these things I'll quote, two years earlier, Lee had also spoken of honor, claiming that, quote, there's no sacrifice I'm not ready to make for the preservation of the Union, save that of honor. I mean, Lee, Lee is, he's a man of his family. He's a member of, the, of course, the very top of the slaveholding aristocracy in the Confederacy. There's nobody above the Lees and the Carters and his other kin in that regard. He has a sense of honor that places him as part of that aristocracy with those of his blood and his class and his section. Uh, he hated the prospect of disunion, but rejected the idea of a country, as he put it, that can only be maintained by swords and bayonets. And he was very much put off by the notion that the war, if the Confederacy lost, would end in the complete overturning of the social system that he'd known his entire life. All of these quotations indicate, and I could cite many more, but I'm going to spare you, they indicate that he frequently characterized the Federals as a brutal foe who often respected neither the laws of God nor the dictates of decency and honor in their interaction with Confederate civilians in the course of the war. He similarly took offense at much of what the radical Republicans wanted to do after the war. Their uh, legislative agenda he found very repellent as well. He didn't approve of legislation or amendments to the Constitution designed to place black people on more equal footing with white people, nor did he believe it fair to disenfranchise or otherwise penalize former Confederates if they took the oath of allegiance. He said if they take the oath of allegiance to the United States, that should wipe the slate clean and they should be able to move forward. I mean, those are essentially the terms that Grant extended at Appomattox, and those Grant didn't make up those terms. Grant's doing what he knew Lincoln wanted him to do there. He'd met with Lincoln uh, just a little while before the Appomattox campaign unfolded. He knew what Lincoln wanted him to do. I think Grant's own instincts were in the same place, but those are Lincoln's terms, not Grant's, that get offered at Appomattox. Lee said, if you take the oath, you should move forward. You should be back in the United States. He worried that the federal government was becoming too powerful and that if it reached a certain level of power, it would simply undo whatever was good about the republic. He said the consolidation of the states into one fast, vast republic, uh, sure to be aggressive abroad and despotic at home, will be the certain precursor of that ruin which has overwhelmed all similar nations in the past. When James Longstreet, who was a favorite of Lee's during the war and a staunch lieutenant, as many of you know, he became anathema to most white Southerners after the war because Longstreet became a Republican and took office from Grant and became a Catholic. I mean, there's the trifecta. What else could he do? He could <laughs> go home and think, is there anything else I can do to make people not like me? I became a Catholic, I'm a Republican, and I like Grant. No, that about covers it. <laughs> Lee and Longstreet remained friends, and when Longstreet asked his old commander in mid-1867 to endorse part of the Republican program, Lee answered very firmly in the negative, observing that, quote, I do not judge the course pursued by the dominant political party to be the one best for the interests of the country. I mean, it's a nice, muted, yet firm <laughs> response to James Longstreet. I believe that Lee's unwavering commitment to behaving honorably and doing his duty after the war prompted him to suppress his strong personal 
feelings and attitudes about what was going on. To his, his, his urge to criticize the North, to criticize the Republican Party and some of their policies. He knew that his behavior, his public behavior, was especially important because he knew he was the most important former Confederate. Jefferson Davis isn't the most important former Confederate. Lee is the most important former Confederate. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia had functioned from about the midpoint of the war forward as the most important national institution in the Confederacy. People didn't look to the Confederate Congress to figure out how the war was going. They looked to R.E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. And in this way, Lee and his army came to function very much as his idol, George Washington, and the Continental Army had functioned during the American Revolution. They're the most important institution. Oh, the capital's in Philadelphia. Oh, wait a minute. No, now it's, now it's moving west. It's a, it's a portable capital as the British. It didn't matter. What mattered was, is Washington and the Continental Army still in the field? If the answer is yes, there's still a chance. That becomes true in the Confederacy as well. Are Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia still in the field? There's a chance for victory. It's, it's not an accident that Appomattox is generally considered the end of the war. It's the end of the war because it's the end of Lee. As Bill said, there's scores of thousands of Confederates under arms at many other points in the Confederacy after Lee surrendered. It doesn't matter because Lee's gone. And if Lee's gone, people on both sides of the Ohio and the Potomac understood that's it. The Confederacy cannot, well, well, Lee understood this after the war. He understood how important his position he was. He saw it whenever he traveled. People just turned out and lavished love on him wherever he went in the South after the war. Nowhere could he move abroad without being greeted with such demonstrations of love and interest as always touched his generous and gracious heart, wrote one of his neighbors here in Lexington uh, after the war. Now, at the Virginia Convention that debated secession in 1861, the president of that convention, a man named Robert Janey from Northern Virginia, he had introduced Lee after Lee had resigned his commission in the United States Army and had become a major general of the Virginia State Forces. Lee didn't go from the U.S. Army to the Confederacy, as you know. He went from the U.S. Army to command of Virginia's military forces. And when Janey introduced Lee to the Virginia Secession Convention, he summoned memories of Light Horse Harry Lee's tribute to George Washington. He told the members of the convention, we pray God, he's looking right at Lee. I know a number of you have stood there in that room in the Capitol. You can go in there now with all the Confederate busts around it. There's Alexander Stevens. There's even Joe Johnston in there, God knows why. But anyway, they're in that room and Janie looks right at R.E. Lee, and says, we pray God most fervently that you may so conduct the operations committed to your charge that it will soon be said of you that you are first in peace. And when the time comes, you will have earned the still prouder distinction of being first in the hearts of your countrymen. I, I think Lee was probably embarrassed by being compared to Washington that way, even though he'd walked past the great uh, statue of Washington on his way into that chamber and had passed Crawford's huge equestrian statue of Washington on the Capitol grounds outside. Now he's being compared specifically to his great idol. I don't think anybody in that room really believed that, in fact, Lee would become the Confederacy's Washington in the course of the war. But anyway, we know that he did. And because he did what he did after the war, after the war, was all the more important as an example to the rest of the Confederate South. Aware of his singular position, Lee strove from Appomattox until his death here in Lexington in October 1870 to set an example for the Confederate South in handling issues relating to Reconstruction, setting an example of what he considered an honorable course of action during an era marked by tremendous political and social turbulence. I think he was what might be called a situational reconciliationist. That is, publicly, he behaved impeccably. He called for putting aside animosity. He said, look forward, don't look backward. Don't, don't wallow in anger, put that aside. Privately, in his private letters, he often seethed at what was going on in Reconstruction and about what had been lost 
during the war. It's this fascinating dichotomy in Lee after the war. I think his sense of honor said publicly, privately, nobody knows what I'm doing privately. Privately, I can express these things about issues I feel strongly about, but publicly, we lost. Publicly, we accept the terms the enemy imposes. Publicly, I cannot call for resistance to what the Republicans in Congress or the military expression of the Republicans in Congress might be doing in the South. And what he said had tremendous impact in the former Confederacy. All of the mainline lost cause arguments that raised Lee up and did other things that, that we're all familiar with now, it's not a coincidence that they didn't really begin until after his death because I don't think Lee would have countenanced them. Even Jubal Early didn't do much of that before, and Jubal Early was basically uncontrollable, except by Ari e. Lee. And Lee wrote to him more than once, just you know, calm down. Maybe dial it back a little bit. And Jubal Early waited. And then when Lee was gone, he was Jubal Early unleashed. And he could do whatever he wanted to do, and did, uh, for the rest of his long and cantankerous life. From the summer of 65 to the end of his life, Lee never deviated from this behavior, this public behavior on his part. And he explained what he was doing to the Confederate general whose name I love to say more than any other, Gustave Touton Beauregard, uh, right after the war. Beauregard, as you know, had been born Pierre Gustave Touton Beauregard, but had dropped Pierre because it seemed to him as sounding too foreign. <laughs> <laughs> so just going with plain Gustave Touton made him just one of the guys, I guess, in his part of Louisiana. But Lee wrote a letter to Gustave Touton Beauregard on October 3rd, 1865. And this is what he said. He, say, he told Beauregard, I'm, I'm requesting a pardon. True patriotism sometimes requires of men to act exactly, exactly contrary at one period to that which it does at another. And the motive which impels them, the desire to do right, is precisely the same. The circumstances which govern their actions change, and their conduct must conform to the new order of things. We lost the war. That's the new order of things and we must conform to that. As was so often the case, Lee looked to his primary hero, George Washington, to clinch his case to Beauregard. At one time, he, Washington, fought against the French under Braddock in the service of the King of Great Britain. At another, he fought with the French at Yorktown under the orders of the Continental Congress of America against the King. Absolutely different behaviors, dictated by exactly the same approach toward what the honorable thing to do was. Although he didn't say so explicitly, Lee's desire to do right surely stemmed from his understanding of duty and honor. A president of Washington College here, you all know this better than I do, a lot of his students were former soldiers, and he would always tell them, look forward, not backward. The future is what's important, not the fact that you lost a war. And a little bit more on that uh, in a minute. Thomas Nelson Page, the Southern author who was uh, entered WNL in 1869, remembered that Lee mandated an end to all combustible rhetoric regarding the North. What you say about the North, Lee told the young men, tends to promote ill feeling and injure the institution. He said something similar in March 1866 to Early. I've already talked a little bit about Early. Early's the great unreconstructed rebel, uh, as you know, who was a corps commander under Lee late in the war, and then became, uh, he, he's one of the two men that Lee gave an affectionate nickname to. He called him my bad old man. That's what he called Early. Early was younger than Lee, but Lee called him my bad old man. And Lee was sort of, he'd look at Early and think, I wish I could do some of those things. Early cursed imaginatively as people at the time said, I've always loved, I, I just wish after someone wrote, Jubal Early was an imaginative cursor, cursor I wish they would have said, for example. <laughs> he said this. 
But they didn't ever do that. They just left us with this, I wonder what imagination in cursing might look like in the mid-19th century. He wrote to Jubal early that we shall have to be patient and suffer for a while at least. Early was complaining about what some former Federals were writing about former Confederates. All controversy will only serve to prolong angry and bitter feeling and postpone the period when reason and charity may resume their sway. He said the same thing to Jefferson Davis's wife, Farina Davis. Uh, <clears throat> shortly after that, she had written to him complaining about Schuyler Colfax, who was a, a Republican politician from uh, Indiana, complaining about Schuyler Colfax, who was insulting former Confederates. And Lee said, I've thought from the time of the secession of hostilities that silence and patience on the part of the South was the true course, and I think so still. These considerations have always kept me from replying to accusations against myself. And he meant replying in a public fashion. Publicly, he's simply not going to do that. Now, he, he thought that his notion of honor didn't mean he couldn't praise his own soldiers. He thought it was important to get their story out. He saw no tension between the, the, go, what honor said to do in terms of whether he would criticize Republicans or what the Federals had done during the war in one way, and praising his own army and what it had done. He, he urged others to do that. He thought about writing, as many of you know, he thought about writing the history of the Army of Northern Virginia for a while and tried to collect records uh, while he was here in Lexington, but the burdens of running the college simply took too much of his time, and in the end, he didn't do it. But he thought about doing it uh, for a while, and he wanted to stress the odds against which his army had fought and what they had achieved against those odds. He, he fired an early salvo in that regard in General Order Number 9, as you know, when he explained the Confederate defeat uh, because of what he called the overwhelming numbers and resources of the Federals. He wanted to get that in print. He wanted to let the rest of the world know that his army, in his view, had fought honorably and well against very long odds. The question of relative strengths really uh, interested him. And later, lost cause writers picked up on this, and that's one of the main things that they, they went even beyond it where they were long odds. For them, it became, in the end, impossible odds, and the Confederacy never could have won. It was a hopeless struggle against overwhelming odds. And there's no loss of honor in losing a war. You never could have won because the Yankees had too much of everything. Well, Confederates didn't believe that during the war. They didn't go to war saying, you know, we cannot win this war. We won't win this war. We'll lose a quarter of a million. Uh, we'll lose, yeah, that's, that's more than a quarter of all of our military-age white men, but we'll do that just to make a point. No, they didn't do that. Of course they thought they would win. And if there had been a Las Vegas in 1776 and 1861, the odds against colonial success would have been much longer than the odds against Confederate success in 1861. But post-war that became a cardinal element of the Confederate explanation for defeat. And, and there is support for that for them from Lee in General Order Number 9. He didn't write the order, as you know. Charles Marshall wrote it. But Marshall talked to Lee before he wrote it, got Lee's ideas in mind. He wrote General Order Number 9. And then Lee fiddled with it a little bit to get it in the, in the language that he really wanted. I'm about to finish, I promise. A number of scholars have complained, really over the last 20 years mostly, that Lee has an undeserved reputation as a post-war conciliator, public conciliator. They concede that he called for submission to the North in his public utterances, but they point out that he, number one, always retained his belief in state rights, which he did, was not enthusiastic about the new racial order in the South, which he was not, and never explicitly conceded that secession was unconstitutional, which he didn't. Uh, one of these scholars, Alan T. Nolan, who was a great friend of mine, I'll say right now, because I'm going to say something else about Alan that might make you think otherwise. Alan wrote an influential book titled Lee Considered. came out in 1991. And Alan wrote this. Contrary to the Lee tradition, it appears that after the war, the general's attitudes matched those of most of his fellow Southerners in spite of some conciliatory statements. He was, in brief, a mainstream secessionist. <clears throat> After the war, the typical Southern partisan one would expect from his environment and experience. 
I believe Nolan's critique is almost completely off the mark. Lee's post-war public stance, in my view, is all the more impressive precisely because it often ran against his private feelings about these things. I really think, and I think it's his sense of honor. How do you behave honorably after being defeated? How do you do it? You do it by doing one thing publicly where you will influence other former Confederates and reserve your true feelings for private situations that you know will not reach the public. I think Lee faced a true sense of his devotion to honor and duty as he understood them in the years after, Ma after Appomattox, and I believe that he passed that test splendidly. We have 10 minutes, I think, if we're supposed to go till 11.30. Anybody have any questions or comments or disagreements? If Virginia had not been on the road to secession, do you think General Lee would have accepted General Scott's offer of command? Would Lee have accepted command of the U.S. Army outside Washington, D.C. if Virginia hadn't seceded? I mean, obviously, I can't answer that. I, I don't know whether he would have or not, but I, I think that there's a chance that he would have if he was really certain that Virginia was going to stay in the United States. Although one of Lee's... We often try to judge loyalties in the late antebellum years in terms of whether this individual is more loyal to the state or to the federal uh, level of government. That's all. Is Lee a Virginian or does he believe in the United States? Does he believe in the Union more than he believes in Virginia? But it's actually more complicated than that because Lee also thought he had a very strong loyalty to the slaveholding South. He thought of himself as a Southerner as well as a Virginian, as well as a citizen of the United States. And he had a powerful allegiance to the United States. I mean, his, his family were Federalists. George Washington, his idol, there's no stronger nationalist than George Washington. George Washington doesn't say, well, the nation's kind of important, but what do the states want? Uh, that's not his approach to things. Lee's father, uh, very much against the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. Uh, at the turn of the century, uh, very much against what Thomas Jefferson was up to at that point. Jefferson was malleable uh, in things. Jefferson could always find another path if necessary or, or, or pretend that someone else found it. Uh, he was really good at that. Uh, so he has, and he has 30 years service in the United States Army. He loves the United States. There's no question about that. But all these different loyalties come into play. The question you're posing is, would his sense of being a, a, a white Southerner, we say Southerner, we mean white Southerner, usually when we use it, is that more powerful? Could he have countenanced leading military forces against Alabama and South Carolina? South Carolina, I mean, South Carolina was a problem for everybody because South Carolina was such a weird, it, it was always doing something, and everybody knew it. Uh, Pettigrew had it exactly right. South Carolina is too big to be an insane asylum and too small to be a republic. I mean, he's from <laughs> South Carolina. He's from South Carolina, and he got it just right. So when South Carolina does something, you can roll your eyes and say it's South Carolina. God, you know, what will they do next? But when seven states are gone, it complicates it. And I'm not sure. I, th I think he admired Winfield Scott a great deal, as we all know. And Scott's a Virginian. He's from Dinwiddie County. And Scott says, please do this. Well, if Virginia hadn't been on the other side, I think he might have, but I, but I don't know. Long answer that isn't an answer. Yes. Lee was here as president of Washington College in 1868 when Grant was elected president. Mm -hmm. Did Lee ever say anything, either publicly or privately? Lee did Grant not said? attack Grant. The fascinating thing to me about Lee and Grant now, see, this is, I, I, you pretend I'm a politician and you ask me a question and then I say what I want to say anyway. <laughs> we see this all the time on television. The fascinating thing to me about Lee and Grant is neither of them ever conceded the abilities of the other. I find this fascinating. Grant said that Joseph, John, he was always more nervous when Joseph Johnston was in front of him than when Lee was. Really, General Grant? Really? What were you were nervous about? That he'd retreat so fast you couldn't catch him? I mean, why would you, why would you be uneasy? Because Joe Johnston, well, Joe Johnston, as we all know, woke up every morning, and his first thought was, what a great day to retreat. <laughs> I can go that way or I can go that way. Life is good. 
Grant was very much put off by the fact, and he put this in his memoirs, and he put it in letters too, he couldn't understand why Lee got a pass. And he believed that Lee got a pass. Lee's a much bloodier general than U.S. Grant, much bloodier. Grant's known as the butcher, not even close to R.E. Lee in terms of the percentage of his soldiers who get shot. If your goal is to get shot and you live in the United States, the Army in Northern Virginia is where you want to be, period. Nothing else, even close, nothing close. All of Grant's battles in the West, before he came East, Shiloh, Chattanooga, Henry and Donaldson, all of them, Vicksburg, 35,000 casualties. Lee's battles in that same period, 95,000 casualties. When does Grant become a bloody general? General Grant, this is Robert E. Lee. He's your new opponent. That's when he became, became a bloody general at the same time every other Union commander who faced Lee did. You cannot be around Robert E. Lee without having piles of casualties. Joe Glattar did a wonderful book on the Army in Northern Virginia, the only one that's done serious statistical sampling about many things. And Joe reckoned that if you're a soldier in Lee's army for three years, that's how long he commanded the army. And as you know, if you're a Confederate soldier and they ever get you in uniform, they never let you out. They keep changing the rules on you as you go along, which many of the soldiers considered fundamental abridgment of individual freedom and liberty. But nonetheless, there you are. You're in forever. If you are in Lee's army, you have a 76% chance of becoming a casualty. Three quarters. Nothing else even close to that in the war. But Grant, even though he'd had his way with all those Forgettable Confederate generals out west, he never would admit that Lee was the best, and Lee wouldn't admit it about Grant. I find that fascinating because usually they're willing to do that. Grant in his memoirs, and I'll second Bill's comments, it's not even close. There's Grant's memoirs and then this gaggle of forgettable voices in the rest of the presidential memoirs. It's really, it's, it's, there's nothing even close. He's not fair to George Thomas and a few others, but he's really, you can tell he's still upset about Lee. He said, the whole Confederate nation was behind Lee. No matter what he did, no one ever criticized him. He had the advantage of having this huge agreement on what he was doing. It's true. And of course, the Democrats in the North were not always behind what Grant was doing. They, attack, they attacked him uh, a great deal late in the war. He never would, never would concede. But Lee owed a great deal to Grant when there was talk about Bringing Lee up on treason charges after the war under the Johnson administration, Grant said, fine, you do that, I will resign as general in chief of the United States Army. And even Andrew Johnson, and I'm not as friendly to him as you are maybe, Bill, even Andrew Johnson, deep in the mush of his gray matter, knew that in a fight between Grant and him, that's not a fight. Grant is a great hero. He's not sort of a great hero. At the end of the war, it's Lincoln and Grant. They're equal heroes. They're not, it's not Lincoln and Grant. We've lost sense of what a towering figure U.S. Grant was. He's the most famous American in the world for all the rest of the 19th century. More people saw U.S. Grant in person than have seen any other American in our history. In person, more saw Grant. When he went around the world, crowds of 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 came out to see him. He had the biggest funeral in American history, has the biggest tomb in, the, in North America. He had a million people at his funeral, another million people when they dedicated his tomb 12 years later. Grant, the most visited tourist attraction in New York City until World War II, was Grant's tomb. We've lost that. We've re and as Bill said, people, oh yeah, he's a drunk. He's a corrupt president and he's a butcher and he smokes a lot of cigars. And he did smoke a lot of cigars, 20 a day. Uh, and so did Sherman, 20 a day, some Homeric bad breath in their tent uh, at night, I think. There's a lot of cigar smoking going on there. One more question, and then it's 11.30. Yes? Would you briefly sum up Lee's um, uh, con visit before Congress after the war, when he was called up to test? Awkward. That's really a summary. That's a very brief summary. I think it's awkward. I, Lee, but it's, but, but it's correct. Lee does not make a misstep in any forum such as that after the war, to my, at least, that I'm aware of. He, he does not. He, is, he behaves impeccably in that regard, impeccably in that regard. And, he, and he's, of course, as you know probably, he, it infuriated Frederick Douglass, 
Lee is quite popular in much of the North right after the war. And a lot of the, of the obituaries in Northern papers, especially Democratic papers in the North, were quite flattering. As, as Douglas said, he didn't understand the nauseating flatteries of Robert E. Lee in 1870 when news of his death went to the North. He said, it seems that what we're going to do is find the person who killed the most loyal men and almost destroyed the Republic and make him a figure to be admired. It drove him crazy. It drove some of the radical Republicans crazy, too. But nonetheless, it was the case. It was the case. And a lot of people in the United States had a sense that Lee was a good loser. He'd been the great bugaboo during the war. It's fascinating. Everybody thinks Gettysburg is the great turning point. If you don't take anything away from my talk today except one thing, take away that Gettysburg was not the turning point of the Civil War. Gettysburg was not the turning point of the Civil War. Absolutely wasn't. After Gettysburg, Confederates, their diaries, letters are filled. Lee's never lost a battle. Lee's never been defeated and never will be. Same attitude in the Northern papers anticipating the Overland Campaign in the spring of 1864. No one's ever beaten Lee, but now Grant will. Poor George Meade. He doesn't even get credit for Gettysburg uh, after a year goes by. It's really interesting. Thank you.